All right. Now, let me give another example. So this is also kind of interesting. And perhaps now you, you get familiar with the ideas of changing, modifying Markov chains. First, you introduce a Markov chain. Then, if it is necessary, necessary you also modify it before you formulate the final uh, heating probabilities. Right? In the meantime, what we are really calculating here are all called the heating probabilities, first heating probabilities. A chain is actually moving. If you think that Markov chain like a particle moving around, right? so you are interested in finding the probability that for the first time the chain hits one of the states before the others. Right? And perhaps you can now help me to help me find the right formulation for this problem. So this is also an exercise from your textbook on page 133. Now I'm solving all difficult exercises in class so that you have the easy ones for homework. <laughs> all right, so what does it say? Okay, we are also given a Markov chain right from the start, okay? A Markov chain with uh, on uh, three states with the following one step transition matrix, right? So let me denote, it, denote the Markov chain again by X right on state 0 1 and 2 right with one state transition probability matrix p defined as like this 0 1 2 0 1 2 okay i don't need this this is 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and 0 0.4, 0 0.1. So state 2 is again what? Absorbing. Once you get there, you cannot get out. Right? State 2. We know initially that this chain starts in state 0. Right? And as we just observed, the chain eventually gets into state 2. Also, let's just draw the state uh, transition diagram. Three, there are three states. For state uh, zero, right? You can go anywhere, including that you can come back to state zero. So you have these trans master transitions. And what else? If you start initially in state one, again, you can either go to zero, come back to state one, or go to state two, right? But so you may go back and forth between state 0 and 1, but eventually you will get into state 2, right? Once you get there, you stay there, right? And what is the question? Now, they want us to calculate the probability that when the process moves into state 2, right, which we know that is going to happen with probability 1, when the, state, when the chain moves into state 2, it moves only through state 1 like this. So what is the, we calculated before the probability that, that it goes eventually a state without going through one state, now it is just the other way around. Right? Starting initially in state 0, you know that eventually the chain is going to go to state 2, but it can go, it can do like this several times and then go like this, or then it can do like this and then go like this. We want the probability of the event that eventually it follows this route. Okay? Here is your question. Okay. What would you do? So think that this is an exam question. You are now on in the exam. Okay, you can share your ideas and I can see right or wrong. So now what makes the problem difficult? Okay, you know that eventually you will get there. You can even define S. No, it doesn't really help in this case. But you, after you enter state 2, you will not be able to remember actually what happened while you were coming there, right? Did you really come like this or like this? So, two variables, what are they? So you will define a function on what the cross product of the state space? 
One and two, what do you mean? One, one and two, the, are, one and two are these? Uh, which state we come from? Right. But uh, you still, if you have in mind using uh, one step, uh, first step analysis or Markov chain, you have to make sure that if you create a new process, it is also a Markov. So uh, that implicitly suggests like that you are trying to actually define another Markov chain. You define you on some state space. Apparently, perhaps you first have to state the, the start with defining what that Markov chain is. Two states. I guess it is possible, but perhaps there is an easier way of doing it. So two states means you are actually increasing the dimension. We don't like to work with high dimensional problems. Try to keep it low. What was the problem? You can go to the same place by taking two different routes, right? And they just, they just merge here, and therefore you cannot really remember what happened. Keep them separate from each other, right? They don't, don't allow these two routes to merge to each other. How can you do that? So we have to modify the chain, right? But then you will ask, if I modify the chain, am I still solving the same problem? You may be solving a problem, a problem for a different chain, and therefore you are solving a different problem. But we have just seen an example. Right? We modified the Markov chain, but the answers were the same. Right? Answers were the same because we were only, the questions were related to what happens until the very first time something happens, and that was actually what the probability we were trying to calculate was related to, right? So it's, we have to play a similar game. So you should actually come up with a simple modification of chain that will allow you actually keep track of how you exactly entered by taking which one, which one of these two routes uh, into state. Can you suggest something? So we don't like that junction. You can break this state into two, right? So this is this was the original. Modify it. Modify it into what? Okay. I will introduce one more state. Two A and two B. So I keep all these transitions, right? But now there will be one transition here and another one here and they are going to be uh, absorbing states. Huh? Does this make sense? And then I will introduce S. Okay, so we modify the state transition uh, uh, diagram. That means now we have a different one state transition probability matrix, right? And most likely we also have a different, therefore we have also a different Markov chain, right? So this is new Markov chain X to the, on a larger state space, like a 0, 1, 2A and 2B, okay? And then, um, right? And then we can define, we can again look this problem like we are playing another game where the game ends the first time the chain enters to state 2A or 2B, right? And uh, the problem, right? We did not write it here explicitly, right? We were trying to calculate what the probability that, right? Markov chain enters state 2 through state 1. Starting initially, I guess in this case, right, in state 0. So that was the original problem, right? Now, now I can write this one, now in terms of this random variable S, right? Now this is when the game ends, and when the game ends, 
right? If the final state of this new chain is 2b rather than 2a, then I know that I, in the original, uh, in the original Markov chain, I must, I must have gone through like this, right? That's it. That's it. Starting as before, initially in stage zero. Okay. All right. So. Okay, that's what we want, right? So this was what we want in the original problem, and we now know that we can get that the answer for that question by seeking for this, uh, seeking an answer for this question in this modified problem, right? Is it clear? Does anyone have any doubts that this is not related with the other one? Huh? Okay, all right, so let us calculate this, right? So this is like, we can just give a name to this. So this is a function you evaluated in state, uh, at state 2b, right? But starting from this point, only again use one step, uh, first step analysis, and it's not really, um, something new, but let's just complete uh, the exercise. So we can start by first identifying the boundary conditions, which is equivalent to saying that the, the values of function u, which they can be uh, figured, out, figured out easily, right? So what is the function in the first place? So we can first generalize this. Uh, I made a mistake anyway, right? So I should have put the initial state rather than the terminal, right? So if this is how we define the function over the entire state space, right? So this is actually new state space. So it is different than the original one, right? Okay, and then this has to be defined for 0, 1 to a and to b. And what we want is actually now u0, right? That's what we want. Okay. Now, if I just stay, restate the question that I raised over there, right? So the easy values of this function are the ones that correspond to these two states, right? So u 2a is now 0 because that's not what I want. That's not my favorite state. This is my favorite state. In this case, it is 1. And with probability 1, you know that you will have, you must have come to state 2 by taking root 1. If we have already started right in state 2b, that's, that's great. Then, what is u0? Again, we, will, we know that we are far away from the terminal condition or the terminal states. Therefore, we can just condition on the first step, right? With probability one half. Well, we have plenty of them actually this time as well. So let, let us just put these numbers. 0.3, you can come back. You can go from 0 to 1.2. Then from 0 to, uh, what are they? From going from 0 to 2 in one step, 0.5. That's what I should write here, right? So this was 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, for 1. So I have these numbers, this middle row, right? This is 0 0.1. You go to 0 bit to 0 0.5. This is 0 0.4, right? So I exactly split this into two. So therefore, the arcs actually remain the same with, together with the probabilities. The only thing is this additional one or what? We don't know which one. They are this thing anyway. Right, so and what was this? You come to 1.1, and I have all the numbers now. Right? Now we can write u0. Now with probability, so with probability 0.3, I am going to come back to state 0, and the Markov property tells me that forget about what happened in the past, so you restart in state 0. You ask, the same question. Therefore, the answer is going to be the same, of course. Right? Again, with probability point 
right? The, in the first step, the chain will move to state one. Once it is there, forgets about the past, looks into the future, asks the same question, therefore the answer is the same. But since now we are in state one, the answer is going to be U1, right? Starting in that state. And then plus, right, with probability 0.5, you will move to state 2A. And the answer to this question is going to be from there on to U sub 2A, right? 0, 1, 2A. And then for U1, what do you have? If you are in state 1 with probability point, uh, point 0.5, that is missing on the graph on the right, but that's okay, I guess. Then you have, you will be in state 0, and the probability of ending up in state 2A is going to be given by U0, plus with probability point 0.1, you will come back to state 1 and probability with probability 0.4, right, you will move to state 2B, right? We have this and then what happens? We have to, four unknowns, four equations, then we can solve this problem, right? The U 2A appears here, so that disappears. U2B equals 1. So this is 1, right? And u0 appear, appears in both sides. We can just combine them, right? So from here you have 0.7 times u0 equals 0.2 times u1. And here you have 0.9 times u1 equals, all right, 0.5 times u0 plus 0.4, right? Then, we were interested in U0, right? So U0 equals, you divide by 0.7, you get 2 over 7 times U1, which is obtained from the second line after you divide by 0.9, right? So this is 5 over 9 times U0 plus 4 over 9, right? Something like this. We just develop this product, you get 10 over... 63 times u0 plus 8 over 63, right? And then if we move to this to the left, you get 53 over 63 times u0 equals 8 over 63. Numbers in the denominator cancel and u0 becomes 8 over 53, another weird number, but that's fine, right? So with this probability, as you are going uh, until you for vacation, you will be going through Akshay, right? That's what happens. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions about this? So you have to be well prepared for such things. But now I gave, I guess, most of the hints about how you can actually twist the Markov chain. So it is not important to work on the same chain in order to answer one question, right? That's part of the modeling. So we cannot really give you just one single recipe and say, okay, no matter what question comes in front of you, there's one single recipe that you can apply all it. No, there is nothing such thing. So we can only illustrate some ideas by looking at different examples. So these are the ones I guess, at least your textbook contains the important, interesting ones. All right? All right. Okay. Let me see. Should I tell you about random walk or age replacement problems? The random walk topic contains a little bit more calculation. So I know that we are depleting our energy in, in this morning, but uh, but this is an important application. Uh, it has important applications to uh, risk processes or real probabilities in insurance, partly in finance. Uh, perhaps you should know about this. Do you know, have you heard about the Gendler's ring problem? Huh? 
you know? Huh? Or you were one of those gamblers who rent actually in a casino? Huh? Does anyone like to play in casino from time to time? No. Nobody wants to say anything. Okay, let's look at this so-called random walk and then study a little bit the so-called gamblers ruin problem. And some of you may think that actually what is this probability about? They all work about the ways to make money by not really working hard but just going to casinos and trying to figure out best way to beat money and things like that. It is not. I gave an example before, right? So if you have some money if you make more money than you really, you actually spend, then you will want to just invest it so that it will grow over time, and, right? You put money today aside in order to spend it in the future. But in that case, if you just put your money in the bank account, but it may not earn as fast as, at least as fast as the inflation rate, then you will be worried about, then you go around. So there is this famous saying, if you don't take any risks, then the earning rate is going to be not uh, large enough or satisfactorily large. So then it is like actually you have money, you don't want to put your money into bank account, it is like actually looking somewhere that you will really gamble a little. Some people choose to put their money in stock market, some in between, so there are also the so-called uh, bonds, bond markets, right, what the state usually uh, issue in order to collect, uh, in order to pay its debt, they borrow money from you and they say, okay, I'm going to offer you an interest rate such as that, even they are not completely secure. And sometimes states also just get bankrupt. The almost two years was about to get bankrupt. But anyway, so things can go wrong. So Gernot's dream problem is still relevant, but of course, just to give the basic ideas, if we start first teaching you the financial engineering, it's going to take too long. So what we do is we say, okay, let's go to a casino with some money. Right? So let's look at the problem, but keep in mind that they, they have applications to bigger, uh, really important problems in real life as well. So I'll just start by describing a Markov chain. Right? So let me give again name X to this. Markov chain. Okay. It is a Markov chain on a finite state space 0, 1 through n. Right? And rather than describing the once the transition matrix, I'm again gonna put on whiteboard the state uh, transition diagram. Right? And it looks like this. All the states are aligned along one line. Right? So let me put I minus 1, I, and I plus 1, just for a general typical state. And at the end, you will, of course, have N minus 1 and N. Right? And in be between those states, there are transitions only if they are next to each other. There won't be these large, big jumps. Right? First, state 0 is absorbing, as well as state N. Okay? And I will also assume that, as I said, you can either go to the left, the very next state, or to the right, the very next state. And, right, likewise, you have all these arcs from one neighbor to another. So this is not possible, right, because it is absorbing, as I said. And these transitions happen with the same probability Q, right? Okay. And likewise, you can go forward, right? You cannot get out of state zero, so we don't have an arc over there, but you can do this, right? They all happen now, of course, with product of one minus Q, they don't come back to it themselves, so intermediate states don't return to themselves. That's also it's a simplifying assumption that I'm going to make, okay? So I'll use the same, instead of one minus Q, I will just write P. Right. Okay, I have these. Right. So this is one example, the so-called 
random walk, right? So RW is short way to write. It's the acronym that I'm going to use when I need. Okay? If this is a random walk um, on this finite state space with two absorbing boundaries. With two absorbing boundaries. Where do such Markov chains er arise? Well, the gambler's ruin problem is one of them. Okay? Here, um, suppose that a gambler, okay, goes a casino with uh, I Turkish liras in his or her packet. Okay? So I have a gambler, right? With initial capital, I Turkish dirhams, right? If I equals zero, there's no point of going in anywhere. Anyway, so we assume that he has some, right? The the casino to which a gambler goes also has some money. If the casino doesn't have any money, then there is also no point of going there, right? So you cannot make any money. You can only lose. That doesn't make sense. Right? So the casino has, just to make things nice and clean, uh, I'll assume the casino has a capital, initial capital, right? We can actually write the same way. N minus I T N. Right? In total, the total capital equals what N? That's the cap, uh, 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 the uh, integer N on the right hand side. Right? Now, so gambler, of course, plays games. So every time gambler just bets one Turkish lira, bets one Turkish lira, okay? Gambler bets each time one TL, right? And well, loses the bet, and therefore the money as well, the bet he puts forward, right? With probability Q, or wins with probability 1 minus Q or just P, right? So here I assume that P plus Q equals 1 and I am also going to assume that Q is strictly between 0 and 1 just to make the problem interesting, right? right? So this game is uh, okay, all right. We can just say, for example, the game is unfair if Q is less than one half. It's super fair. It is called super fair. It's more than fair if P is greater than one half, right? If P equals one half, it is just fair. Fair for both casinos. So the likelihood of winning and losing are all the same. Then it, it is called a fair game, right? Okay. But we don't need that specification. But this is important for in order to do some sensible calculations. All right. Then, what does? How can I uh, think of Xn in this case? Well, in this case, we can define or denote by Xn the capital of fortune of the gambler at the. Uh, At the beginning or at the end? Which one is better? When if I talk about x zero, right? So this is the initial capital, right? Okay. Maybe I can just say that after the end game, right? After the zeroth game is like the before you even play, right? After the first game, you know what happens and so on. So. Right? So this is now n equals 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. Alright? Then, then what do you get? Then you know that from time n to n plus 1, xn can either increase by 1 or decrease by 1. Right? Just as in this case. xn is going to be, is, is going to be a st uh, stochastic process on the state space consisting of integers 0 through n. Right? Because 
if the gambler and zero zero corresponds to what? When gambler loses all of his or her money, right? So this is when the gambler gets bankrupt or gambler ruins. And n state n corresponds to what? Gambler get gets rich, and the uh, uh, casino gets ruined. And in that case, the game is again over because casino doesn't have any money. Gambler doesn't have any anything else left to play against, right? So in these two states, the game just finish finishes, right? And uh, therefore, they are actually absorbing states, right? And in the meantime, chain or the this stochastic process extend is uh, a Markov chain because at any time, right, in order to predict what happens in the future, you only need to know the current amount of money that the gambler has. You don't really need to remember what happened in the past, right? Because all you need to know is how much money the guy has, right? It is true because I haven't said that uh, explicitly, right? Loses wins. Right, gambler loses and wins with these probabilities, independently of. You should specify that independently of the outcomes of past gains. That's important. Right? If this is also true, then indeed this process X is a Markov chain with the state transition diagram, right? Okay, now we got to ourselves an interesting process and it can also help us answer interesting questions, like what? What would a gambler be interested in? When? Right, so, but you know that there are two possible answers for that, right? Because a gambler just plays indefinitely long until either he gets bankrupt or casino gets bankrupt. So the amount of money that the gambler is going to have equals either zero or n, right? But still we don't know which one is going to happen. And the gambler will, of course, be interested in the likelihood of either getting bankrupt or equivalently, right, so that they, the probability should add up to one, right, either getting bankrupt or getting rich, right? If we know the probability value for one of those probabilities, we know also the other one, right? That also needs actually a proof, but the, we'll calculate one of them and then we'll see that actually we can do sim similar analysis for the other. Right, so for example, let us calculate the probability that the gambler, right, ruins, right, eventually, starting with some initial, okay, I'm going to write that also in plain English, starting with initial capital I. Right? So I can be anything zero between zero and n, right? For one, for when I equals zero and n, we obviously know what the answer is, but uh, it's good to define this for every possible initial capital. Let's give it a name like UI, right? So we can then calculate this process again by using first step analysis, right? The f first of all, as we did before, we can define the time when the game is over. So this is the first time, right? The first time when the fortune or the capital of the gambler equals zero or n. Right? That's when the game is going to be over. One of the sides will not have money at all to play, to continue the game forward, so they have to go to their homes, right? And, well, of course, this is the bankruptcy state, and UI, in this case, equals what? The probability then. So I can now rewrite this thing, 
by using this random variable, in fact, by looking at this, right? The value of the capital, the capital at the time when the game is over, the capital of the gambler at the time when the game is over. That's exactly what this is, right? Right? X sub S, the capital of the gambler when the game is over equals zero. That's when the gambler is going to get uh, bankrupt, starting at time zero with initial capital I. That's what we want to calculate. Right? But once you see uh, stopping time S and with two outcomes uh, right, for the process when time S comes, and you are basically asking the question that the chain gets absorbed into state zero when the game is over rather than stay there. Right? So that's what we have to calculate. But once you figure out the, the formulation of the problem, the rest is very similar to what we have done before. Right? Again, you can just specify the boundary conditions first. Or equivalently, the values of this function that you can figure out right away very easily. And they correspond to what? Of course, this critical uh, states, right? U0 equals what? Huh? What does U0 mean? The initial capital of the gambler is zero. And what is the likelihood that this guy is bankrupt? One. He doesn't have any money at all, anyway. Right? How about UN? N is the other possibility, zero, because he's already, he has gotten all, of the, all the money available in the market, anyway, in the casino anyway, right? So there is no way to get bankrupt because there is nobody to play against. What can you do? It's a happy case anyway, so we shouldn't be too worried about it in that case, right? Now the values that are unclear at the moment are the ones between 1 and n minus 1, right? Pick one of them, so i being anywhere between 1 and n minus 1, what can I say about ui? So the likelihood of bankruptcy of this gambler starting with initial capital I. But he's obviously going to play, right? With probability P, or with probability Q, he's going to lose, and with probability P, he's going to win, right? If he loses, his uh, capital goes to I minus 1, decreases by 1, and from there on, he's just going to continue because he still has enough money to play for at least one more time. But now the chain is like Marcos, so all the future is going to be independent of the past. Now that he knows that he has exactly I minus 1 Turkish dirhams, right, in his pocket, right, the probability that he's going to get eventually bankrupt is given again by this function u, but now evaluated at I minus 1. Plus, I left too much space, p times now by the same argument, but now with one more dollar, right, you have what? The new the, the probability of getting ruined uh, eventually is given by u evaluated at i minus i plus 1. That's it. Now, that's the basic equation, which is true for all i's. Let me write it here. Between 1 and n minus 1. And now we have to use this. How many equations do I have? n minus 1. And, and n plus 1. Total In total, I have n plus 1 linear equations. How many unknowns do I have? n plus 1. Right? Starts from 0, goes up all the way up to n. So, I have exact, exactly as many num uh, equations as the number of unknowns. So, I should be able to solve these equations uniquely. Hopefully, uniquely. Right? So, we just go through that exercise. So, there are uh, different ways to handle these things, but one way uh, to do that, to use the fact that the p plus q equals 1, right, and ui is actually being multiplied by 1 there. It is hidden, but it is there, right? So you can replace that 1 with p plus q first, right? And then you take this term, let's say to the left, and take 
right? So the, this Q will match Q times UI. That will be P times UI left. Why don't we just take this that to the right, right? We'll match that with another term times P, right? So what happens here is you have on the left-hand side Q times UI minus UI minus 1 equals P times UI plus 1 minus UI. Right? Again, this is true for every I between 1 and, and minus 1. Right? So then we, we can just repeat this and write UI minus 1, UI minus UI minus 1 in terms of UI minus 1 minus UI minus 2. We will just op, uh, uh, repeat this thing but as we decrease I to 0 or 1, I guess 1, right? That's the smallest value that we can actually play with, right? So we, I'm first trying to calculate, I'm trying to find a value for this difference rather than the value of the original function. When we get something for the difference, then we will just sum them up because the UI is what? The sum of the differences UI minus UI, UI minus UI minus 1 plus UI minus 1 minus UI minus 2, right? This telescopic stuff, we'll see in a moment. Then it, it, this is going to go somewhere from there, right? And at the end, you, we will get a nice expression for this one, for, for the ring probability. Okay, what exactly is that? Okay, first of all, from here we can write what? Ui plus 1 minus Ui. This difference is P time, P over Q times Ui minus Ui minus 1, right? But then we can repeat it one more time. This is, we can just write this part as P times, P over Q times Ui minus 1 minus Ui minus 2. And you don't forget this, right? P over Q, and we can just continue like this, right? So when there is two, then you see you multiply P over Q twice. When there is one, you multiply P over Q with itself only once. So if and we are allowed this relation, right? It's true for all these possible I's. I can go all the way down to um, where am I going? when i equals 1, right, so at the end I can do it, I can, the last term for which I can apply this iteration is u1 minus u0, right, when i equals 1, but then if this is 0, you see 2, so we can just write this power, 2, so 2 plus i minus 2 is always i, 1 plus i minus 1 is always i, if this is 0, then I must say p, over Q to the power, you should put I so that the sum is still I, right? That's how I can remember, otherwise I get lost as well, okay? So what did we do? So we simplified the problem a little bit, right? Now on the right hand side there is only one unknown left. We know what this is, U0 is, where is that? U0 is 1, right? Because if you start with 0, right? Really? Um, you are right. Does this really make a difference? It should, right? Not for the method, but the answer obviously depends on that. Right? So P comes from there, P is here, you divide by. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, you are right. Anything else? Is there any, any other problems? All right. Okay, so this is true. Again, let us not forget for i equals 1 through n minus 1, right? All right. Now what can I do? All right. So let me copy this first and last element because I will now start summing things up to find uh, an expression for ui plus 1 only. So I have u1 minus 1, right? So we have that. And, well, instead of i, you can write this, this line for i minus 1, then 
you get ui minus ui minus 1. Now we replace i with i minus 1, therefore I have this, multiplied by this. Right? I can do that. Actually, you can do this now by replacing i with i minus 2. You get another one. It goes like this. Until when? So this is, I'm allowed to write these things for when, as long as i is between 1 and n minus 1. And at the end, you will be able to write for i equals 1. Right? When you put i equals 1, you get u2 minus u1 equals to what? Q over P, right? Uh, that's it, I guess, right? U1 minus 1. Am I right? Right? Why did I do... Why did I write like this? Because when I sum, now they will cancel, these two will cancel. There will be another term uh, of the same kind here. This will also cancel. And the only thing that is left on the left hand side is ui minus 1 minus u1 equals the sum which is u1 minus 1 multiplied by the sum of q over p to the power k as k changes from 1 right 1 to i right i have that right so in this thing if i can figure out what u1 is i am done right if I know what u1 is, then ui plus 1 is going to be a sometimes another quantity that I know, right? But uh, how can I calculate that u1? So remember, there are two boundary conditions, and we use only one of them. We use the fact that the u0 equals 1, but I haven't really used this un equals, the fact that un equals 0, right? I haven't used that yet. Can I use it now? Yes, because this is true for i equals n minus 1. Let's just replace i with n minus 1. Then i plus 1 becomes n. So you have u n minus u1 equals u1 minus 1 times. Don't forget to replace i with n minus 1. Right? Like this. Right? Then use the fact that u n, right? This one, right? Equals zero, and therefore, what do we get? Well, what am I getting from here? I could have written the one on the left actually in a simpler way. Why didn't I do that? May I do that first? Because I, I really don't like this form. So we'll do that anyway. But I could have put this equation in a better form, I believe. Okay. The unknown u1 is there. Why don't we just take this to the right as well so that there will be this left alone, so u1 plus u1 minus the sum, right? Okay, okay. Now, see, we can make this thing look like this, and now we can write the right hand side in a more compact way. To do that, I will just subtract 1 from both sides. So this then, I will have u, another u1 minus 1 that I can now join with the other sum. Right? Subtract 1 from both sides. So you will have u1 minus ui plus 1 minus 1 equals u1 minus 1 there. But there is an, another one here, so we can just combine them. And then this summation, starting from 1 to i of q over p to the power k plus 1. Right? But See, that's the same as actually starting the summation from 0. Because 0 to the power, this is just 1, right? So that's nice. That's nice. Again, as we said, this is true for this. And then, I guess now it is time to replace, right? Replace i with 
n minus 1 in this expression to get what? u n minus 1 equals u1 minus 1 times the sum from 0 to n minus 1 of what? q over p to the power k. Right? Okay, we're almost done. So, I know that this equals 0, right? So, I don't have anything left here. So, minus 1 equals to this, right? And I hate to see this quantity there. Well, it is always, is also there. How can you cancel them? Just divide this equation by that, right? So you divide left-hand side by minus 1, you get, right, 1 minus ui plus 1 equals, right? Now when you divide right-hand side by this, the unknown part will cancel each other. Then in the numerator you have a sum from 0 to i, right, of q over p to the power k, in the, in the denominator, you have this sum from 0 to n minus 1 of what? q over p to the power k. Right? What is this probability anyway? What is this probability 1 minus u i plus 1? Say it again. No, in English. What does it, what probability or what kind of event? Huh? Winning, getting rich. So which has actually a simpler and nicer probability? So we already calculated the probability that the gambler will eventually uh, get rich, right? But let's stick to our program and calculate the probability of losing and getting bankrupt, right? Okay, we can just do this, but we can. Uh, this is what the geometric series uh, uh, truncated at a finite time, right? So we can then calculate and find a more compact formula. But that depends on whether this is uh, 1 or not, whether p equals 1 half or it is different than 1 half, right? So if p equals 1 half, right? So q equals 1 half as well, so this is 1. You sum 1 i plus 1 many times. Here you sum it for n many times, right? And then this goes to the right, this goes to the left, right? This is 1 minus i plus 1, uh, uh, i plus 1, that's it, divided by n. But if p is different than 1 half, then you can use this uh, geometric series ex uh, expansion, which gives you 1 minus, what is this? Hmm. From 0 to i, it is, I guess, 1 minus q over p to the power i plus 1. You divide by something, and that something appears in the denominator as well, so they will cancel, so I don't worry about that. And if you the numerator for the denominator, the numerator of the solution for the denominator becomes, what, 1 minus q over p to the power uh, n minus 1 plus 1, which is a Right. What happened here? So this is too close. It is the 1 minus q over p to the power i plus 1. Right? Does that simplify in any way? You can write this thing in a compact way, I guess, in a more compact way, but you get the idea. All right? So we saw another application of first uh, step analysis, right? In which case we also found the crucial answer for a very important economical problem, right? When does our gambler, or the, what, the, what is the probability that the gamblers get bankrupt? You may also want to calculate yourselves the expected number of games the gambler has to play until the game is over, right? We did a similar ex, uh, exercise at the very beginning. Then we did not do the same thing. Well, here it, it is going to be interesting as well, right? So it's a boring thing to get stuck in casino. So he has to stay there until the game is over. So you may want to know for how long he's going to stay there. Or from a more realistic point of view, well, if you get in certain cases, you have to pay fees each time you want to make a transaction. That, that's true for financial markets. I don't know whether that's true for the casinos. For casinos, I guess you just pay an initial 
fee and then you can stay there as long as you want. But if this is really, if the real motivation was really a financial application where whenever you want to invest some, a part of your money in your uh, uh, bank account into stocks, for example, then you have to pay a transaction fee. So as many times as you change your mind, or as many times as you play this game, you have to pay a fee. And that fee is going to grow until, what? Until the game is over. So then you will want to know on average how many games you are going to play until you get rich. Because that times the fee that you pay will also be actually deduced from your earnings. You have to know that before you decide whether you should really play this game or not. Because you don't want to... There are some banks, they charge really handsome fees for this one, and you better just steer away from them. Right? You have to know on average how many games you have to play in this game. So let's make that an interesting ex exercise for you, which is likely to appear in the exam. Okay? All right, let's give it a 10-minute ten, ten break again, and then... Uh, do some other look at some other problems. All right? You get tired? Huh? Two hours is enough, I guess, when it comes to stochastics.